Hey everyone, welcome to our root service. Today's scripture reading comes out of Romans 8, uh, 12 to 17. Last week we talked about the Holy Spirit descending on the disciples. This week we're talking about what the Holy Spirit does in us as Christians. Paul's letter talks about the Holy Spirit empowering us to have freedom from sinning. Because we have the Holy Spirit within us, he empowers us to stop sinning. He says that the Spirit has mortified the flesh. The way that Paul is using the word flesh in this letter is describing the sinful nature in our body. And he tells us to put our sinful flesh to death. Not that, we, not that having a physical body is evil, but he's just describing our sinful tendencies as the flesh, just that term. Uh, and we can only overcome those sinful desires by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Paul also mentions something interesting in verse 15. He says that we didn't receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. When someone lives according to the flesh, according to the sinful desires of the heart, they live in fear of God. But Paul encourages us as Christians, when you have the Holy Spirit within you, you should no longer be enslaved to fearing God. If you have the Holy, uh, being a, or well, we should fear the Lord, but we should not be uh, afraid of him in the sense of, uh, just being concerned with punishment. Uh, if you have the Holy Spirit within you, you have confidence to come to God because he has adopted you. He's now your father and he calls you his son or daughter. God doesn't want to put his children to shame. He wants them to be glorified with him. The same way that a king wants to raise his son, the prince, to, to stand tall and to be proud, that's what our God desires for us to put off the desires of the flesh and to be transformed and glorified with him. So if you're wondering what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life, he is changing your desires to be holy. He is empowering you to obey God, even though it's hard uh, and he's put a permanent seal of confidence for you to stand before God and know that he is your father and you are his child. So let's read this and uh, let's hear about the Holy Spirit's work in us. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to, the, uh, to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all those led by God's spirits are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may, be also, so that we may also be glorified with him. Dear God, Thank you for this wonderful day. Lord, please help us to absorb and apply what Pastor Daniel uh, will teach us in his sermon today. Uh, Lord, we tend to forget um, all that you have done for us in the past. Yeah, we tend to forget that Jesus died on the cross for us to pay for our sins. Lord, uh, I pray that you help us to keep that in mind. Also, uh, for all those who are going through exam season right now with finals and AP exams. Uh, Lord, I pray that you bless them and help them get through these chaotic times. Um, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Right, it's time for announcements. Small groups are today at 1130 right after the service. We're going to discuss the sermon and talk about how to apply it to our lives. So we'll be having a graduation barbecue on June 19th at the Santa Susana Park and Railroad at 1030 a.m. There's a there's one last change that we have to announce, but this will be a seniors only barbecue. Sorry about this last change, guys, but the park has strict rules on how many people are able to be in one party together, and the number is lower than we expected. So we need to change this to a senior-only event with senior families. Don't worry, we'll have a lot more celebrations coming in the summer. We don't want the rest of you to feel left out, so we have more exciting things in the coming months. 
Uh, just look forward to those uh, and we'll we'll get that all worked out as these restrictions, ro uh, you know, as the restrictions get less strict and uh, we can bring more people in uh, for these for these events. Church reopening will happen in June. The in-person 930 service, Sunday service will happen on June 6th. That's next week. Uh, the, the way that this in-person gathering is gonna work is you'll come in and see a table with name tags and wristbands. Someone will take your temperature to make sure you're doing okay. And then we'll give you a wristband color. So the colors, if uh, you're not vaccinated and you wanna keep your distance, you'll take a red wristband. If you're not vaccinated, but you're comfortable interacting with people, you'll take a yellow wristband. And if you're vaccinated, you take a green wristband. Uh, we'll have it all printed out and ready to go for you guys when you come. So uh, we're gonna ask that if, and we're gonna have to ask if you guys do take a red wristband, be serious about it, okay? Don't take a red wristband and start hugging everyone. That doesn't make sense. Hold to what you choose. Uh, uh, the, take a yellow wristband if that's what you want to do and you're not vaccinated. So we'll have people there that will explain everything again if you're confused about that process. But this is all to make sure that we can have a safe regathering experience for everyone. If you're hesitant to come, uh, I understand that we're, we're doing what we can to make sure that it feels as, as safe an environment as possible. Uh, when you come to church, you'll notice that the hallway will be cleared. There won't be any foosball tables or couches because we want to make every precaution for people to keep their distance. Um, I know more of you are getting vaccinated uh, as time goes on. The, our teachers and our parents, uh, we're spending, we've been spending the past few weeks praying for you guys as you get ready to come back to in-person. Our next, uh, uh, and speaking of in-person, our next in-person Friday will be June 11th. We won't have food, but we'll have icebreakers and praise and other things ready for you guys. So uh, we're excited to come back to in-person and we'll provide more details on what we'll be doing for the Friday nights. This past week, we did a session on engaging culture. We analyzed different clips and, uh, well, actually we didn't do that. <laughs> we, we actually had to pivot and ask uh, questions like, if a Christian movie is bad, do I still have to watch it and call it good because it's Christian? Or if a TV show or movie promotes a different religion or other worldly values, should I refuse to watch it? And a lot of other questions. Uh, I hope this session was helpful for you and I hope these allow you to see how our faith is actually meant to engage with every single aspect of our lives. And finally, this Friday night will actually be our last Friday night online. I thought it would be fun for us to spend time together. And now that you're done with tests and it's summertime, I wanted to celebrate uh, with us to play a few icebreakers of your cho of your choosing. We can play Mafia, we can play Among Us, Word Match, Gartic Phone, Scriblio, Codenames, whatever you guys are up for. Join us for our last uh, online Friday to celebrate the end of the season and coming on into the next. Finally, our Roots prayer page is in the description below. If there's anything that I can pray for or our teachers can pray for, fill out that form below and let us know. With that, let's get into our message for today. Right now, with where you guys are at school uh, and classes and tests and all of this, I think for most of you, you can't wait for your school to end. You can't wait for your tests to be over so you can start your summer vacation and get on with having fun with your friends, play whatever you want, spend time with family. Those of you that are still testing, as I'm saying this, summer cannot come soon enough for you. It's so close, it's crazy near, you're at the finish line, you're almost there, and that feeling is thrilling, it's awesome. You have that as your hope. It's keeping you going some nights when you're up late studying for a test, when you're busting your butt, you've got that thought in the back of your head, just two more weeks, just one more week, and summer will be here. What if I was to tell you though, that you have something to look forward to even more than your summer this year? What if I were to tell you that years from now, you will actually never have to go to school again? What if I told you that when you graduate college, you can choose whether or not you go to school again? You don't have to go. What if I told you that at that point, you never have to take another test again if you don't want to. You'll, you'll never have teachers again. You won't have to take subjects that you don't care about. Eventually, you get out of school. In comparison to the hope that you have in your summer vacation, um, that hope is a lot better, is a lot greater, so much more awesome. 
And yet, why does me telling you that feel a little bit less encouraging than your summer vacation? Why does that hope for you getting out of school eventually altogether feel so much more, so much less important right now? Here's why. The hope for summer vacation is so close, but the hope for your school ending for good is still really, really far. For some reason, the hope that's closer, even though it's so much lesser, encourages us more. And the hope that's greater encourages us less because it's so far away. It feels like it'll never, we'll never get there. And there's so many things in life that feel this way. Parents and teachers that are saving up for retirement, you know that a good amount of your savings is in your retirement fund, but that feels so far away right now. It feels like you have, you barely have anything now, and it's hard to hope in retirement that seems so far away. We know that these hopes are real. We, we know that we'll have a good amount of retirement money if we keep saving. We will, and we also know that we will end school one day. That's for sure. School will end. We'll have a career in something. These aren't fake hopes. These are facts. And yet, because they're far, not very encouraging right now, if we're going through a hard time right now. There is hope that Christians have that's just like this. It's a hope that we know is sure. We know it's going to happen. We're excited about it. We're looking forward to it. But because it seems so far away, it's not all that encouraging to us. So what is this hope for us as Christians? And how can we be encouraged by this hope if it still seems so far away? Those are the two questions that I want to ask today. What is this hope, and how can that hope be encouraging for us if it's still so far away? The passage we're going to read about today is going to get into this hope. So turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, and we're going to read out of, we're going to read out of chapter 4. We're going to start with verses 13 to 18. So let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way through Jesus, God will bring him with uh, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you by a word from the Lord: We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice and the trumpet of God, and the dead will, in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Okay, so people are sleeping People are flying. <laughs> what What did I just read, right? So what's happening here? This church in Thessalonica is a church that Paul established, but the church is facing persecution from Jews that weren't persuaded by the gospel. And some of the believers here have died. And Paul says that they've fallen asleep, okay? This isn't like baby language that Paul is using. It's not like a situation where if Eli were to come over to me and when he's like three years old and he asks, Dad, why isn't this person moving anymore? Oh, Eli, um, they've fallen asleep uh, forever. And now I probably wouldn't explain death to Eli that way, but you guys get the idea. That's not what Paul is. That's not what Paul is doing here. Paul isn't doing that. He is intentionally calling these deaths sleep. These people have fallen asleep. Paul is making a statement here. These people are only asleep. Because they've gone to be with the Lord for now, but when Jesus comes back, their bodies will rise and they will experience Jesus's return with all the believers that are still alive. They will witness Jesus's return alongside everyone. So Paul's encouragement in verse 13 is this. Christian, the grief that you experience when someone dies, when someone passes away, that grief that you have is different. Notice Paul doesn't say don't grieve. Uh... He doesn't say don't grieve because they just fell asleep. No, Paul says we still grieve 
because death is terrible and undeniably saddening. You're allowed to grieve, okay? It'd be, it'd be terrible if Christians had to say to each other, hey, don't worry about this person that you love that just died. They're just asleep. Like, I would hate to do funerals like that. That would be, like, awful. Just going up to that pulpit and going, everyone chill out, okay? Stop those tears, Janet, all right? Just, he's just asleep. Get over it. No, we, we still grieve, but it's different. Our grief has hope. Our grief has an end. Our grief's days are numbered. Because the Christian hope is this. Jesus will come back one day and make all things right. The hope, the encouragement that we have as Christians is that one day Jesus will return and redeem and resurrect and restore what was lost. He will come to heal. He will come to make right the broken and sinfulness in this world. This is the distant hope that all Christians have. This is the encouragement that we're all able to give to each other. For, the, for, for anyone who has passed away, we can understand these believers are currently asleep because we know that when Jesus comes, in the same way that Jesus was raised from the dead, we will be raised also. That's massive. That's huge. But again, it's like I said in the beginning. Sometimes when that hope seems so far away and that grief feels so real right now, it's so difficult for that to be an encouragement. We say this as Christians. We say this is what we believe, but it's so far hard to feel encouraged by it. It's like saying to someone who's who's like broke, like, don't have it doesn't have a penny to his name and like it's saying that to you know dude this is i know this is so hard for you right now and, and you need money but in 70 years your retirement will be epic <laughs> okay i need money now like it, it's like you guys are struggling in school and someone comes up to you and say don't worry in eight to ten more years School is over forever. Okay, but I have a terrible chem test tomorrow. Like, like it's it's just you're you're just like well okay thanks for stating the obvious, but this sucks now. This is terrible now. What am I supposed to do with this? That that feels like such a weak consolation because grief is so strong and that day feels so far. So that's what I want to get into next. We have this hope in Jesus, but how can we be encouraged by this hope if it's so far away? And my the first point that I want to make is this. We need to know this is the only real hope that we have. We need to know that this is the only real hope that we have. Let's turn to chapter 5, verse 1 to 4, just going to the next chapter over. Chapter 5, verse 1 to 4. About the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to know, you, you do not need anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. When they say peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark for this day to surprise you like a thief. All right, so what's Paul talking about here? Uh, basically, no one knows the day or the hour that the, the return of Jesus happens. It's going to come like a thief in the night. It's going to come like labor pains on a woman, like Esther teacher had Esther someone even had no idea when Eli was coming out. It just like we were we were I was editing the sermon video at one point and she just like boom she just like got up and was like we need to go to the hospital like it's just out of nowhere. We won't know when that time comes. Uh, and uh, but but the struggle that we have so there's a, there's an additional struggle there. We don't know when when that day comes, but we also know that it seems very distant. But what we need to know here is that this is real hope, though. 
This is the ultimate hope that we have. Every other hope that we try to hope in um, is either just superficial positivity. It's, it's like just like trying to think positively in a bad situation, or it's just a, a consolation. It's like, oh, you, you feel better, but it doesn't really deal with the problem. It's temporary hope. It helps us to feel better now, but it doesn't solve the main issue. If you're someone that dislikes the testing, the pressure, the grades, the anxiety, your real hope isn't, well, hey, right now you get three months off before you have to come back in the fall and do it all over again. Your ultimate hope needs to be, no, eventually I'll learn everything I need to and I don't have to attend school anymore. That's your real hope, not a three month like period. Summer vacation is temporary. It consoles you for a little while. It makes you feel better for a little bit, but it won't deal with the main issue here. You deal with the issue here by understanding one day I graduate, I get what I need, and this season of my life ends. And this is what Paul means in verse three. There will be times where people will say, peace and security, it's finally here. There will be moments when people think that their hope has finally arrived in this life, and it's not. It's kind of like summer vacation. It's temporary or it's superficial positivity. People are going to say this is going to provide us with peace and security at any point. They'll say, if we do this reform, if we, if we make ourselves part of this movement, if we cancel this person, if we elect this person, if this would just happen in the world, there would be peace. And time and time again, we've seen people who say this hope is finally here and all our problems will be solved, but there's still conflict in the world. Paul is reminding us, look, we can, you, you can pray for peace and security in this life, but make no mistake, there is nothing that exists on earth that will bring lasting peace and security. It can't be found in a world messed up by sin. It can't be solved by people who are fallen and sinful. Someone without sin, someone without imperfections, someone who loves us enough to care for this messed up world needs to come in and do something. And we have that hope in the gospel. Jesus will come to make all things right and put an end to sin and evil and death. So we don't grieve like others grieve. We don't fall into despair because we have real lasting hope in Jesus. Not temporary, not superficial, real, concrete, permanent hope. It might be a distant hope, but we need to recognize it for what it is. It's the only hope that will last. Paul says, comfort people grieving in the world now with this hope, because that's the hope that matters. Everything else you try to comfort people might be a, you might try to comfort people with, it might be a close hope, it might be a hope that's near, but it's temporary. So Paul says, hold on to this hope, because even though it's far, it's real, it's permanent, it's lasting, Jesus will come back and he's gonna redeem everything. And the reason why we need to encourage each other with the return of Jesus is because that's what, that's what gives us hope that lasts. We're not meant to settle for superficial positivity or consolation. When we're faced with real grief or death in this life, we're not just supposed to put off our pain with Netflix or games. We're not just meant to drown out our grief with substances or marijuana until we, we want to be sober. We're not meant to be superficial and pretend everything is okay when it's not. We're not meant to just put it out of our minds and just be thinking about something else. That's not, that's how the world might try to deal with grief, but not the Christian. Christians have real hope, a real hope. Grief ends. The resurrection is just the beginning for us. Death is defeated. Jesus is king. But Paul doesn't end there. Paul says, when you know this about God, when you're aware of this hope that you have, it's going to change the way you live because you have this information. It's going to affect how you live out in the world. We're going to go to verses 5 to 11 now. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4 to 11. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark for this day to surprise you like a thief. 
For you are all children. Oh, sorry. That started in verse four. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then let us not sleep like the rest, but let us stay awake and be self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love and the helmet of hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. Okay, so more sleep language and at night and during the day. What's all this mean? Paul is saying, because you have a legitimate hope, live as if you walk in the light. Don't walk in darkness. So this idea of night is not that nighttime is evil, though during that time, that's definitely when shady things would happen at night. Uh, so that's just what Paul is alluding to. What Paul is saying here is the, the difference between day and night is just morally uh, how we live morally, uh, live morally upright lives, walk in the light, live as if you belong to the day, not to the night. Um, so because a proper reaction to knowing uh, this truth about God, to knowing the gospel, is live for God, live self-controlled, live in faith and in love. This is true of anything in life. If you have information that's impactful, it's going to affect how you live. If you've been starving and you're living off of ketchup packets from In-N-Out and saltine crackers from like this, like Sizzler's soup aisle, like, and you're just like putting that on each other and you're living off of that because you don't have any money and you win the lottery with that information, with that change, you're not going to keep eating like that. You go out and you buy yourself a proper meal. Why would you starve yourself if you know you won the lottery? If you know that Jesus is coming back to make all things right and that the evil day, evil's days are numbered and people who commit evil will face judgment, why would you live in a way that perpetuates that evil? That's our hope. Every time we're faced with something twisted and messed up, every time we're faced with something terribly evil or wicked, every time we feel like injustice is done to us, we're meant to encourage ourselves and others with this hope. Jesus will return and he will make all things right. So live in the light. Live walking with him. Live that way in obedience to the Lord belong to the day not to the night a day is coming where god will make all this right god will keep an account of all of this so don't pay back evil for evil don't lose your self-control keep striving to live in love and faith because you don't grieve like other people do you don't fall into despair because you have the information on how everything else will pan out you have a hope in Jesus. That's good news. So live for him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this great hope that we have in the gospel. And God, I pray for any of our students that have been grieving, that have lost someone. Lord, would you help us to see how this hope is a permanent, lasting, real, solid, tangible hope that we have in you. You will put an end to all that is wrong and wicked and evil in this broken world that is marred by sin. God, I pray that you help us to look forward to the day that you return when you deliver us when you make all things right so god in the meantime while we live on this earth give us strength to follow and obey you give us strength to live according to your word give us strength to be self-controlled and to give generously love genuinely 
walk faithfully with you. We thank you, God. We lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, we're going to spend some time responding to God's word in praise, with our, uh, with our praises, with our offering, uh, and reciting the Apostles' Creed. So would you join me right now to do that? If you have your offering, uh, put that in an envelope and, and mail that into church, or uh, come, uh, come bring it to next week's service where we have it in person. Uh, that's crazy, right? Uh, last online service. Um, uh, but right now, let's respond to God's word with our praises, with our offering, and reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God our Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, who will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Christ alone. Can ever block 
me from his sin till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand sing of that great hope that we have in Christ that permanent hope that lasting hope not just a consolation, it's not superficial positivity. We have this gift in Christ. So we sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken it. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, sing of that, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip for me, you have broken. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you this day and thank you for being the awesome God that you are. Lord, as our 2020-2021 school year ends, looking back, there are things we have done that pleased you and there are things that we've done or didn't do that hurt you. In our failures and sin, kindly forgive us in your gentleness, mercy, and grace. And in our victories, continue to encourage and strengthen us with humility and character. We thank you for our graduating high school seniors and middle school students being promoted to high school. Continue to guide and watch over them, whether their future road seems bright or uncertain. Provide them with faith that trusts you with all things, knowing that you are a sovereign God who cares and loves them dearly. Father, we confess it has been difficult worshiping online for the last 15 months. But we thank you for placing Pastor Daniel, Elder James, Deacon Frank, Deacon Henry, and all our teachers and volunteers in our church and in our lives to help us worship you properly in the best way possible. Not only that, they also helped us get closer to you, taught us more about you, and what it means to be part of the church, the body of Christ. May your blessings be upon them, and may we continue to learn from them so that we too can learn to serve each other and the church and all the people who need Christ. Lord, we are excited and look forward to getting together in person starting next week. May you continue to watch over our physical and mental health and provide us with wisdom so that we may transition the best way we can. We recognize everyone's comfort level to this pandemic is different, so help us to be understanding and respectful to everyone in our congregation when we meet a church. Lord, we thank you once again for being who you are, faithful and loving Father. All this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.